Hey everybody, Evan Savage here. I'm the pastor of Grassroots Church. Thank you for joining us uh, by watching our messages from this past week or maybe weeks before. We are glad that you're taking time out of your week to learn, to engage with our church from an online point of view. We would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings for tangible community worship and of course some messages as well. Uh, and if that interests you, you, we would love for you to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Thank you again, and I hope that this message is edifying to your spirit. We are continuing our series uh, called Go And, and this is a picture of me pulling Jesse back from music tour <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> all those veins, we, we did a whole bunch of pull-ups before we took this photo. Um, yeah, 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 no tattoos. We, we cropped them out or whatever. Um, now, but we're in this series, Go and learning what it looks like to make disciples. Uh, but we began, and we're still, before we even get to the disciple-making discussion, uh, we are uh, kind of unpacking our guiding, what we are calling our guiding phrase as a church. And this guiding phrase, I'm going to say it every week until we memorize it. It's, we exist. And, we, and the reason why we have this is so, let me, before I say it, before I say it, I almost fell. Before I say it, um, the reason why we have this is when people ask us what the heck is grassroots all about, we can say, and why don't we say this together, hey, how about that? So it's in your brains like elementary school, we exist to glorify God by being disciples that make disciples that glorify God. Now you will never forget it, right? You will never, ever forget it. So when people ask us, what, who are we? We could just point to this simple little phrase and say, this is why we exist. We do not exist for anything, up, for any other reason than to glorify God. Last week we started talking about the glory of God, or we talked about the glory of God, and, and how God's glory is revealed through his presence and what we said, his holiness, or the perfection of his attributes. His presence, the omnipresence of God, the idea that God is everywhere all the time, all at once, that we could experience God in any situation. We always also talked about his guiding presence, or his, what is known as the manifest presence of God, it's that presence that when people talk about the move of the spirit, they're talking about the manifest presence of God. And we also talked about the dwelling presence of God, how, how God dwelled in the tent of meeting and then God dwelled in the tabernacle and dwelled in the temple and through the Holy Spirit, God dwells within his church or hopefully dwells within his church. And we also talked about the perfection of his attributes, his holiness, it's that, that it's expressed through grace and compassion and love and justice and mercy. And so we talked, so we know kind of uh, on some surface level what the glory of God is. And today what I really want to talk about is how do we glorify God? How do we do the thing? How do we actually be a people that glorify God? How do we do it? Where do we begin? How do we as a community, a church, grow in our glorification abilities? How can we grow in the ability to glorify God? Uh, I'm going to be a little bit all over scripture today. Uh, and let me, I'm going to be 100% honest. This is a hard, this was like one of the harder sermons to write. There are a bunch of books on the glory of God. There are a bunch of commentators and commentaries on the glory of God. There's not a lot written and not a lot thought about on what it means to glorify God. It's not really easy. And, and there were so many avenues I wanted to take this whole week. I was like, I could go here, I could go there, I could go up, I, I, I could do a whole bunch of stuff. But it kept me getting murkier and murkier and murkier and murkier. And I was like, I just wanna know how do I glorify God. So this morning, I have four pretty simple, basic things. It's not an exhaustive list. It's not an all-encompassing list. But there are four things that could help us begin to live a life that glorifies God. The first thing is, what does the word glorify mean? Uh, the word glorify, uh, it's also synonymous with the word exalt, to exalt God or to glorify. It means to lift up 
to lift God up, to lift his name up, to, to honor as well. It can be used as that. Uh, honor in scripture, uh, we tend to think, uh, like one of the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and mother. For some reason, we think that means to obey. Now, it's good to obey your parents' children, Micah. It's good to obey your parents, right? But that's not necessarily what honor means. Honor is also, it's kind of like the, the interpersonal thing when, when, when in the Ten Commandments, when it says, do not use the Lord's name in vain, as we've discussed, it's do not claim to be a follower of Jesus, yet act in complete opposition of that following. That's using the Lord's name in vain. Similarly, when you are honoring your father and your mother, it has nothing to do with how good or bad of parents they are. It's just not bringing shame, not bringing uh, any sort of negativity to the name that they have given you. Because it's not just your parents, it's their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents all throughout history. Uh, and I think a lot of times when we talk about glorifying God, I think what, what I think what come, at least what comes into my mind is like, man, it just sounds so stinking boring, right? Like, I want to enjoy life. I want to enjoy a football game on a Sunday afternoon. I want to enjoy hanging out with friends. I want to enjoy going to hear music or see art or whatever people do. I want to enjoy those things, but on, glorifying God just sounds like I just got to be on my knees and in constant prayer all the time. I was thinking as I was writing this, I have a, uh, an Eastern Orthodox friend, he's a priest, uh, and he and I get together once or twice a year, and great guy, love him, uh, and we always talk about, we begin talking about theology, but he's like a, a huge deadhead, like he loves the Grateful Dead. So we'll be sitting there, and this guy's in the, this black robe, big beard, giant cross on his, on his chest, and it goes, in, and then he just starts talking about Grateful Dead. He's like, I love the Grateful Dead. It's so awesome. I love it. And then, then we get into Bob Dylan, and then we talk about some other stuff. It's really hilarious. But one of the things I noticed about him is, uh, and this is really a, a, the, one of the beauties of Eastern Orthodoxy, is, is they truly, everything that they do, the things they love, and even when uh, he says something disparaging, he's always either says, forgive me, God, for I don't mean to be angry, or thank God for Bob Dylan. He always says, thank God for Bob Dylan every time we are getting together. But every, every statement, everything that comes out of his mouth, he is pointing his own mind and his own eyes back to God. It's for the glory of God. It reminds me of Ecclesiastes. We all know, or some of you might know Ecclesiastes. It's a book about a teacher who's teaching things. And one of the teachings is eat, drink, and be merry. We know that. Eat, drink, and be merry. But the whole point of the book is really a book about glorifying God in all things that we do. If you know, he says uh, in English, it's meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. It's that, that word actually means smoke. It's like grasping at nothing. Everything is pointless unless you are glorifying God through all things. Eat, drink, be merry. And so I like to define this. Glorifying God simply is having God at the forefront of our consciousness at all times. Having God at the forefront of our consciousness in good times and in bad, when we are, maybe we shouldn't be talking bad about people, but when we do talk bad about people, because we all do it, we could say, you know what, God, that was not, that was not holy of me. That was not right of me. Forgive me. So I have four things this morning I want to talk about that could help us begin the path of glorifying God. The first one is this, embrace suffering. Throughout scripture, especially, especially throughout the New Testament, glorifying God is always mentioned in the context of suffering. Always mentioned in the context of suffering. Now, for the first century church, their suffering was a little bit more evident than maybe ours. You have to realize that they, if they gathered together in worship, they didn't gather together in freedom like we do, where we could just show up and worship and feel safe. They gathered in worship knowing full well that there was a good likelihood that the police or whoever were, were the version of the police back then could show up to their gathering place and haul them all away, men, women, and children. Or that they would go and they would preach the gospel in the temple and, of, and people would pick up stones and threaten to stone them. The, the suffering was far more evident. We have kind of a beautiful privilege 
of where we live and when we live, because there are people who are gathering at this very moment that are doing so regardless of their lives, right? They're doing so regardless of who's gonna walk in the door, regardless of the dangers that exist outside of their gathering place, but they embrace that suffering. That's why James chapter one, James, he says that consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, that you face trials of many kinds because those trials bring a perseverance and that perseverance is like a ref essentially a refining fire for your faith, it strengthens your faith. Now it's very difficult, I think, for us today to understand suffering. Just very, very difficult. It's very, suffering is one of those problems that, that we have with Christianity. Like, why? Like, what's the point of this? Why should we do this? But, as I was doing a little bit of deep dive, the word suffering in, that is often used in the New Testament is also translated many other times as, as this, it's the same word as passion. This is where we get, you remember the passion of the Christ, the Mel Gibson movie? from I don't know, probably 20 years ago now, which is kind of insane. Uh, it's called the passion of Christ because it was, it was that deep, intimate passion that he had for all people that allowed him to endure and go through that suffering. The word that is actually often translated as passion is also a word that is used in other Greek texts as sexual passion, intimate, deep, 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 intimate passion. You have a deep desire, a guttural, you know, like have you ever like, do you remember like high school or junior high when you are around that girl or that guy that you like and you get all that, that guttural feelings? It's that deep, deep, deep passion that you have. In John, in the book of John, John chapters 15 and 16, Jesus himself gives us really two different, two different great ideas. One, how to deal with suffering and two, well, they're both how to deal with suffering and two, kind of what's the point of suffering. So the first one is John 15, verses 18 and 19. Jesus says this to his disciples, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first or hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Far too often, I think, as followers of Jesus, regardless of uh, the, the political spectrum that you fall on, far too often I think we're all just trying to get the world on our side. We're all just trying to get the world on our side. We're all just trying to, whether it's through forcing legislation through a political mechanism to get the world to do what we want the world to do, or maybe we start uh, convoluting some things about scripture or convoluting things about the grace of God so that we can get the world on our side so that the world can embrace us. And all Jesus is saying, the world's gonna hate you because it hated me first. And the truth of the matter is, church, I think too often, rather than making disciples of Jesus, we are trying to get other people to get the world on our side. We're trying to go through other mechanisms, institutions, uh, thought leaders, whatever it is, we're trying to get other people to get the world on our side rather than making authentic and real followers, not just attenders, not just consumers, but followers of Jesus. I think... One of the things, and this kept creeping up, this has crept up, or especially over the past 10 years, but embracing suffering, I think, begins with the realization. We have to realize that we are not citizens of this place. We are not citizens of this world, that, that we have been called beyond it, that we are called to love regardless, that we are called to care for people Regardless, that we, whatever happens in this world, this world's gonna keep moving, but we are called to be citizens of the kingdom of God. You see, when we do that, when we realize that we are not citizens, when people come up to us and they say things like, uh, I don't know, you just believe in a bunch of fairy tales, or maybe they're just angry at you, or maybe they're throwing stones, or saying mean tweets, or writing, or making dumb TikToks that we could say, that's okay, the world hates me because it hated Jesus first. And it's okay. I can continue to pursue, I can continue to love people regardless. And then there's John chapter 16. And this kind of helps us deal with suffering a little bit. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him, Jesus knew 
they wanted to ask him, and so he said to them, are you asking one another about what I said? He just got done kind of teaching them uh, during the Last Supper. What I said, in a little while you will not see me. Again, in a little while you will not see me. Truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy from you. Uh, have you ever been in like a rough situation or a bad situation? Every once in a while, I have a, a good friend in the army. He'll call me every, from my time in the army. He will call me every once in a while. His name's Bill. Love Bill. Uh, and Bill will call me and we'll just be chit-chatting and my brain is like, man, I miss this. Like I miss sitting around at the office just chumming it up with my buddies. I miss those guys. I miss my friends. I miss those. And then I'm like, oh man, this sounds, you guys sound like you're having so much fun. And then I'm like, yeah, but I hated 90% of it. <laughs> I have to remember that I hated like 90% of my time, that I didn't enjoy it. But when you're done, when you go through the bad times, you start to recall those good times, you start to recall the joyful times you had, those bad things start to fade, do they not? Uh, if you give birth to a child, I have not given birth, but my wife has given birth to three of them. And yes, it's terrible and it's painful and it's hard. But if you ever are with somebody who's given birth, like two minutes after the birth, like the pain is out, like they're not even thinking about it. Why? Because of the joy of a child. Dealing with suffering is always understanding that we are going to be able to rest, one day rest in the, in the forgive, forgivefulness, forgivefulness of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, and be unified with Jesus again. First Peter chapter four, verses 12 through 19. Peter writes this, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you. As if something, uh, as if something were unusual were happening to you, instead rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also rejoice with the great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of God is. Because uh, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or suffer as a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. That's a big one. Med don't meddle, by the way. But anyhow. Uh, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, then, the, then what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God. Then he quotes Proverbs 11. And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of, an ungodly and, of the ungodly and the sinner? Verse 19. So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. How do you deal with suffering? You entrust yourself to the faithfulness of God. I think a lot of times we just try to... Uh, and it's not just the church, but it's uh, probably in all situations. We just try to make our life as easy as possible. <laughs> we try to make our following of Jesus as easy as possible. So that, that usually means that, that we dumb things down or we change what we believe about things because it's hard. The truth of the matter is Christian, Christianity is hard. It's not meant to be easy. If it were easy, everybody would be a follower of Jesus. It's not easy. It is not meant to be easy. It is hard. And so we glorify God by embracing our suffering, by not running away from the hardships, but running through them with the full support and leadership of the Holy Spirit. And we stand firm in the faith while people are slinging stones or writing mean tweets about us. So that's the first one, is embrace suffering. The second thing of how we can glorify God, this is a big one for us uh, good Americans, it's be humble enough to be humbled. We have to be humble enough to be humbled. James chapter four, verses one through 10. I love the book of James. If you've never read the book of James, read the book of James. Uh, it's like a punch in the face. But James chapter four, verses one through 10. 
James writes this, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterous people. That's always a hard, like when, when James uses this phrase a bunch, but when people say you adulterous people, that, that, that kind of strikes chords. Uh, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be your friend of the, whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scriptures say, or the scripture says, the spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Uh, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you, or he will lift you up. You have to be humble enough to be humbled. I think so much of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and a a disciple maker, it just really must be born out of a place and a posture of humility. And humility literally is getting out of God's way. Uh, Many of you might know the story of Jacob, Jacob whose name is changed to Israel. But in the moment that Jacob's name is made to Israel, what is that story? He wrestles with God. In uh, verses 28, it's Genesis 32, 28 through 32. It's kind of the end of this. He says, your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then made the place, named the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, he said, yet my life has been spared. The sun shone on him as he passed by Penuel, limping because of his hip. And to that day, the, Jew, the Jewish people do not eat the thigh muscle because it's close to the hip. Jacob lived the rest of his life with a limp because he encountered God. It got me to thinking, when you truly encounter God, you have the scars to prove it. You have the scars to prove that you have encountered God. You cannot encounter God and have nothing to show for it. Those who, the, uh, I was thinking about this, uh, there's so much, I always complain about the church, but there's so much wrong with the church today and so often do I see so many pastors and leaders and teachers, they're like, hey man, our church is cool, I'm cool, we're so happy, we're all this, all this joy, all this blah, 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 whatever, and I'm just like, where are the scars of you encountering God? You're boasting, you're proud, you're arrogant, you, you're living wealthy, you're doing all these things, where are the scars of your encounter with God? Because if you do not have the scars to encounter with God, that from that encountering of God, then you might not have actually encountered God. But I love that. God resists the proud, but exalts the humble. So the second thing is be humble enough to be humbled. The third thing is worship. One of the most central, 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 central things to glorifying God is worship. Now let me begin. Worship is not music. Music can be worshipful, But worship is not just sitting in rows and singing songs. That is part of it, but that is not it. Uh, Let me go to probably the greatest commentator on worship uh, in modern Christian history, a man by the name of A.W. Tozer, who was a Christian Missionary Alliance pastor uh, in Chicago for many years, about 100 years ago, or whatever, probably a little bit less than that. I can't remember. But uh, you've heard this first quote. I'm going to repeat it because it's too good not to repeat it. A.W. Tozer says this. I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. If you are bored and turned off by the worship of God, our creator, the creator of all things, then you cannot enter the kingdom. You are just not ready for it. 
You're not ready to see God face to face. You're not ready to rest in his grace and his mercy and his love and his compassion. The rest of these are pretty hard hitting. So here we go. Here's another one from A.W. Tozer. If you're not worshiping God on Monday the way you did the day before, perhaps you're not worshiping, worshiping him at all. If you're not worshiping God on Monday the way that you were the day before, perhaps you're not worshiping him at all. He says this, we must never rest until everything inside of us worships God. Everything inside of us, not just our minds, not just our hands, not just our energy, but everything inside of us rejoices by the presence and the movement of God. Much like John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb when he just encountered the, the unborn baby Jesus. Everything inside of us must worship God. And I put this one in here just for kicks. I remind you that there are churches so completely out of the hands of God that if the Holy Spirit withdrew from them, they wouldn't find it out for many months. There's so many churches that are so out of the hands of God. Church, I, my prayer is that not that we're just like a, like a fun, comfortable church to go to, but I, I pray that we are a church that is resting truly in the hands of God that we become a people who worship and honor and exalt and glorify God. He's essentially saying they are so distant from God that they don't realize it. They're too busy relying on their own abilities, their own cunning, and their own skill. That's all they are doing. They're not relying on the movement of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews, this one's long, bear with me. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 29. Uh, if you don't know Hebrews, we don't really know who the author was, but it's actually more of us, somebody wrote down a sermon. So it's, read this as if somebody is teaching this uh, like I'm teaching you right now. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. And make sure that there isn't any immoral, irreverent people like Esau, that's Jacob's brother, who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find an opportunity for repentance. That's another, how to glorify God, be a people of repentance. Verse uh, 18. For you have not come to what could be uh, touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word to be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, he must be stoned. The appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. We talked about that last week. When you enter the presence of God, the only response is fear and trembling. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of righteousness, uh, righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which says better things than the blood of Abel. See to it. You do not reject the one who speaks. For if they do not escape when they rejected him who warned them on earth, even less will we, uh, will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. His voice shook, uh, shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised. Uh, now he has promised. Yet once more I will, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, indicates the removal of what can be shaken, that is, created things so that what is not shaken might remain. Here's the point of why I'm reading all of this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve, that word serve is worship. We may worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For one God is a, for our God is a consuming fire. Worshiping God is central central to our glorification of him. Central, if, if, if 
Like we could be good people, we could do good things, we could help people, we could love neighbor, we could do all that stuff, but if we are not actively doing so in a posture of continual worship of God, then we, it's all for naught, it's all pointless, it's, gonna, it's a shaky ground. We're gonna be like that thing, the, the, that, the shaky heavens and the shaky earth just disappeared. So worship is central to the glorification of God. Then the fourth one is this, make disciples. The fourth thing is make disciples. Now, I'm not going to get into this because we're doing like a bunch of weeks on what it looks like to make disciples. We'll get there. But I'll just do this one thing. By making disciples, by sacrificing your time, sacrificing your energy, sacrificing your mind, sacrificing your relational capacity, when you do that and you sacrifice that in order to share the love and grace of Jesus and to invite others into his grace, that ultimately brings God glory. It ultimately brings God glory. We'll get to there in a few weeks. I don't want to. I'm, I'm, I'm about to keep going. I don't want to. I don't want to waste a good sermon series. So we'll get there in a few weeks. Make disciples is the fourth, fourth step. But a reminder of this: Isaiah 43:7. Everyone who call, who is called by my name, who I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Whom I have created for my glory. Church, we are created for the glory of God. I think we might read that in a very weird way. That statement created created for his glory. It might make us a little uneasy. We might be like, well, is God like some weird narcissistic dude who just wants like a bunch of things? Like that, that's like my, we could read it that way. But that takes the whole personality of God out of the equation. The whole being of God, that we are created for his glory does not imply, imply that we are created to be robotic slaves, but we are created to rest, to share, to experience, and to be transformed by his glory. To be transformed, to be moved and shaken and stirred and, and grown up into Christ likeness we are it's it's to it's to rest in perfection it's to rest in grace it's to rest in mercy we are created for that and nothing else and we do so by our worship our humility our suffering and our discipleship that being in the glory of god through our glorifying him that thing is the thing that brings us true wholeness it makes us whole, it gives us direction, it gives us purpose, it gives us uh, in, uh, enlightenment in many ways. So church this morning, I want us to really, really focus on enhancing our abilities and our desires to glorify God. Really, when we come together and worship, don't just come here because you want to uh, hear if I have anything good to say or if you want to finally see Jesse and Heather play music after five weeks or whatever it is. Like, don't just do that. We gather together to express our love for one another, our love for God, to, to be built up and grown into Christ's likeness and ultimately to begin our weeks in all reverence and in worship of him. So in all ways, church, all ways, let us enhance our ability to glorify him. Let's pray together. Mm-hmm.